1 Samuel chapter 22, uh, from verse 1 and 2. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam, uh, where when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, uh, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. And the title of today's message is uh, From the Cave of Adullam to the Kingdom. And so, uh, today we are doing the final of three messages on King David. And so for the past few messages, uh, we have, uh, we saw God working in the heart of faith of, of David, who was uh, not so great outwardly, right? There was nothing so spectacular about David physically or outwardly, but we remember that David was able to truly overcome. God saw his heart. He was even over, able to overcome the great Goliath, um, really because of God. Right? It was not because he had anything great outwardly, but it was his God. was with God. And uh, we remember that victory of the people whose hearts are closest to God. Right? When our hearts are close to God, gaining victory in that. So uh, today, we, uh, what we are seeing in today's scene is not only David, but we see others around him. Uh, the type of people that also joined David in his journey to be a great king in Israelite history. Right? So later on, he became a very, the greatest right, of kings in Israelite history. And so we know David was the kind of person whose heart was really after God. Well, who were uh, the people that joined him? And so we read that here, the people that joined David. And so what happened? Basically, these people that were with David, I'll explain the context. It's that after defeating Goliath, right, um, it's not that things went so smoothly for David after that. Uh, in fact, um, oh, well, on one hand, he did gain a lot of victories, and so people loved him, right? But the problem was, was that people loved him more than Saul, right? More than the king at the time, Saul. And so although David was able to gain more victory, and he was able to gain the praise and adoration of the people, uh, at the same time, Saul became uh, very jealous. Um, in fact, it was Saul's own son, Jonathan, who became best friends with David. And so Jonathan loved David. And then you know, Saul's daughter, uh, Michal, uh, loved and married David as well, too. So you're talking about Saul's children loving David as well, too. And so you know, Saul felt threatened because the people loved David, his children loved David, and he was getting praise and adoration. Um, that uh, Saul himself didn't get. And so what happened? Uh, the jealous Saul uh, tried to kill David. Right? He tried to kill David, and so David fled. And uh, what's happening here in today's scene is, is that he fled to this cave here, the cave of Adullam, right? It says in verse 1, he fled here to the cave of Adullam. And so think about it. For David, who had gained great victories, and you know, seemingly like it would go forward very smoothly, uh, but rather he hid and he was here in the cave of Agilent. David had lost everything here in the cave of Agilent. And really what we come to find is that David hit rock bottom, right? David hit rock bottom here at the cave of Agilent. He lost, uh, he had to flee, you know, that, that place, right? The, the country of Saul, right, where Saul was, so, in essence, he lost his wife, he lost his best friend, he lost his job. You know, he was the general, and so he lost his job as the general of his army. He lost also his dignity and self-worth being here at the cave of Agenda. And So, really, uh, everything, right? Everything about David was hitting rock bottom here at, uh, at the cave of Agenda. Um And it comes to us, too, right? I mean, it comes to us, those of us who have lost everything. Right, who have been at a place of rock bottom. Right? We might have had um, losing our friends and family, losing our job, losing uh, the dreams and the self-dignity that I have. Uh, there are times really in our life that we could have experienced rock bottom. Uh, but we also come to find that it's only when we experience the deep, deep valley uh, that we can also see uh, the high mountain. Of course, we know from history that David did experience the high mountain. He was the greatest king in all of Israel, gaining the greatest victories. 
uh, but we come to find that David's journey to um, really become king and really rebuild the kingdom of Israel started at rock bottom. It was at the cave, right? At this cave of Ajalon. And so, uh, like I said, who are the people that joined him, right? Who are the people that also joined David at rock bottom and were with him in the cave of Ajalon? Well, it says that there were 400 people here, right? There were 400 people here. And what it records is that they were in distress or in debt or discontented. Right? In debt and in distress and discontented. So 400 people here like that. So we're talking about you know, David with the 400 people that really, really shared in the suffering of David. Right? That David, not only is David hitting rock bottom, but it is the people that were sharing together with him that were in suffering and in pain and in rock bottom as well also. And so what we come to find about these people, these 400, is that for them, life itself was very hard, right? In debt and in distress and discontented. There are probably, inside of that cave, there was something like deep sorrow that was inside of them that they shared together. In fact, I think it was their David on all the 400 people that were there in the cave of Bajalam. There was a suffering, a distress, and debt, and discontentment in them, but it was something that only they could understand among one another, right? That other people could not understand. The great Saul and the people living in great houses over in that place, they could not understand. It's the kind of thing that uh, if you are not there, uh, then you don't know. If you're not there, if you're not there, then how can you know that, that deep, deep sorrow and that pain in the cave? If, if you are not there when you're in distress and in debt and discontented, if this has never happened to you, right? if you haven't lost your family and friends and you haven't lost your job and your dreams and, and all kinds of things, then how can you know? Right? How can you know what it feels like for that to happen? And so, you know, these were the people in that cave that, that knew, right? That knew and were there and experienced this together, right? It's really, really that kind of deep, deep thing. If you don't know, if you, if you weren't there, then you don't know. You know, I, I have to tell uh, Boy Scout stories, you know, in sermon, and it's like that in Boy Scouts too. You, you take you know, pride in <laughs> real camping. You know, if you're going camping, you carry this heavy backpack. It's not like you're just like car camping, you know, we call that car camping. That is, it's just like getting out of your car and setting the tent right up next to your car. <laughs> you know, camping like that. But no, you have to carry the 30 pound backpack, you have to hike, you have to cook, you have to clean everything, and it's hard work and, you know, it's suffering together. But, uh, you know, through this time when you're, you know, suffering and it's bad weather and you're trying to cook with the fire, the wind keeps blowing the fire out and, and all these kinds of things, but, you know, there's an unspoken bond that. Is for right? The ones who are, you know, you know, toughing it out together. You know, there is this unspoken bond together. And you know, really, uh, what happens when you suffer together? What happens when you suffer together? When you're you're all in pain and you're suffering together, is that you need to help each other out, right? Like mean, even just a little bit, like just a little bit of comfort, just a little bit of helping out. Like, oh, you know, this. This thing I have to carry, this, this stove I have to carry, it's just too heavy for me right now. And so someone takes, takes it for you for, for a few miles, and then someone else, you know, and then, and then you take it back after some time. And you, what you do is you're suffering together and you're serving together, is what I'm trying to say. You, know, you suffer together and you serve one another in love. You suffer together and you serve together. And so, you know, we come to find that this was how the cave of Agilent was. The ones who were in debt and in distress and discontented were the ones suffering together, but also helping each other out. They were serving one another, suffering together and serving together. And that is what church is as well, too. We need to know that church is this kind of place. You know, what is church? You know, church is not like a, a big networking opportunity. You know, some people think like this, right? Oh, you know, it's a big networking opportunity. You know, elite people in very good circumstances, and then the elite people in good circumstances, you know, everyone being friends um, like that. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like this kind of thing. But no, actually what you come to find out is you know, more than elite people being in good circumstances and networking with one another, uh, 
the truth about church is, is that you know it's the people who are in pain, you know the people who are suffering uh, in this world in distress and in debt and in discontented. Right? You know, is there anyone like that? <laughs> distress and in debt and in discontent. You know, it's to gather together one another and understand each other. You know, the truth is, is that church is for sinners. Right? It's for sinners who are suffering in the pain of this world. But what, what happens is, is that we receive the comfort of Jesus Christ. Right? Although we are suffering, it is that Jesus suffered for us on the cross and he knows our pain. And so we receive comfort from Jesus Christ that suffered on the cross. And then when we suffer together, we also help one another. We help each other out, and we help others out there in the world that are suffering too. And so you suffer together, and you serve together. Right? We suffer together, and we serve together. And you realize even more that you know church is more than just about my own individual experience. You know, so it's not just that I'm just receiving Jesus, and I have this experience of salvation, and it's just there on my own, right? You know, so some people do like that. But, you know, we have people who say, oh, I, uh, I do the Sabbath. <laughs> I go to Sunday service and I celebrate the Sabbath and I do it on uh, some other day and I do it on my own. Right? Like that. So, so it's good. You know, it's good to worship God and be a fruit. But, you know, also God sent us people together that you know, we suffer together and we serve together. And so it's not just my own salvation experience that I have, but it's that. There's everyone else in the world that's suffering together as well, too. And, you know, you're together, and you serve together, and you give worship. You give holy worship to God together as well, too, being a fruit. You know, on Sunday, we are giving worship. And it's not just me being a fruit before God, but, you know, there is power in uh, the ones who are truly with God being together like that and giving the fruit of worship before God. And so... You know, really, you come to find after some time that only someone who has suffered together and served together really, really knows this. And so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, do we really know this heart? You know, do we really know, have we ever really experienced this in our life? The ones, the spiritual family that has suffered together and served together. And so, you know, when you live in the world, you, you become, you know, very jaded about people. And, uh, you know, what... You know how, how people are together and, and not meeting expectations and, and, and it's very very hard and so you know it's that you know not understanding one another's hearts and you know people treating each other at a distance like this but you know, this is why we need God's people together the ones who have suffered together the ones who really realize that and understand the suffering and so you know only the the ones who have suffered together can understand that true serving with and so David, David uh, became the, the leader of these people. That's what it records, right? David became the leader of these 400 that were together with him. Right? So David became the leader of those suffering and serving together. And out of the people that suffered and served together, right, this became the starting point of a new dream of the kingdom, right? Because we know that King David became the great king of Israel, the greatest of kings, took, took Israel to its very golden age. And so how was it able to be taken to the golden age of this country without the grace of God? And so the grace of God poured down upon these people that were suffering together and serving together in the cave. And it was also in the cave that God gave them this dream of a new kingdom. That, oh, a new great kingdom has to be built and so, you know, this dream came like that. You know, how did this dream come? It's not like, you know, this dream came because there were a bunch of elite, smart people, right? And they gathered together, you know, and they figured it out because they were so smart. They figured it out and they figured out how to take Israel, you know, to this great, great place of the, the golden age. No, it wasn't like that. No, it was by the grace of God. It's the same thing for all of us. How can the great dream of God's kingdom come to us too? It's not a bunch of elite people that gather together and then figure something out because, you know, we're so smart like that. No, this dream didn't come from something fake like this. No, this dream came from something very real, right? It came from something very real 
and genuine, and it was this real, genuine time in the cave. Right? It was a real, genuine experience and time in the cave with God and with those who were suffering together and serving together. And in the pain and in the hardship and in the sorrowful place of these people gathering together, that is how a very genuine dream of God's kingdom could come, right? It's that, you know, we, you know, that, that, that dream, like, if we're going to really, really build a better place here on earth as it is in heaven, thy kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, you know, it's not going to come through something fake. It's not going to come just because, you know, a bunch of smart people got together and thought about it and then, you know, create something fake like that. No, actually, it's like this. This is the place where God is at in pain and in hardship and in sorrow. These people gain the dream of the kingdom. And we need to be like that also. We, uh, I wish we could be these 400 of Agilent that suffer together and serve together for God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. So um, these were the people that gathered together. Um, now I want to take a little bit, a few verses here or there that sort of take us on the journey to, uh, you know, for David and how it was for him. Um, to, you know, give a little bit of context, we should first read a couple chapters earlier. 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and in verse 28 and 29. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. And so really, you know, David hated him and became the enemy of Saul. Saul hated David and became the enemy of David. He really, really sees that David is an enemy, and what happens is, is he starts crazily pursuing David out of jealousy. And now, um, there were multiple times that, that this happened, that, that, that Saul tried to kill David, but it didn't happen. Um, and then uh, David also has a chance, actually, at one point, a little bit later on, after the cave of Agilum, to kill Saul. And so, uh, let's look at this. This is 1 Samuel. Chapter 24. So Saul definitely tries to kill David many, many, many times, but you know, how about David to Saul? So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 24 uh, and verse 3 through 7. Uh, he came to the sheep pens along the way, a cave was there, and Saul went to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand. For you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a, a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord anointed or lifted my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave. You know, this kind of see Saul is, uh, you know, relieving himself. <laughs> you know what he's doing, and then so you know he's he's busy doing his his work, right? <laughs> and then, you know, here here comes you know David. He creeps up. You know, he sees this happening. Oh, he's open to being attacked, and his men think, oh, you know, it's time. This is the day that the Lord gave you in order for you to, you know, kill your enemy Saul, and so. You know, David is, is creeping up on him, and maybe he's thinking about it, maybe he's thinking about taking that sword, sticking it into the back of Saul at this point, but then he, he hits and then he kind of half-heartedly maybe just hits the cloak instead, and so just a little part of the, the robe, the cloak of Saul, comes off, and then David is conscious-stricken, you know? He's very conscious-stricken. Now he says, I, you know, I can't do this. You know, I can't do that, right? This is the Lord, the one God anointed, to just take revenge like this. And this is David's righteousness here. You know, we see that David had many, many chances to kill Saul, but rather than doing things by the human way of violence, right? Um, he instead actually supports Saul in many ways. He doesn't kill him here. And then there's all of Israel's enemies as well, too. And he, um, he attacks Israel's enemies also, right? And so there is this kind of uh, there is this kind of thing that happens. He is the one that helps out David, helps out Israel while Saul is still remaining king. Remember, David is not king here yet um, at, 
this point here is David helping out Israel while Saul is still king. And so he attacked Israel's enemies. We can see that in 1 Samuel chapter 27, in verse 7 and 8. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 27, in 7 and 8. It says, Now David lived in the Philistine territory for a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people lived in the land and extended to from Shur in Egypt. And so now David had to live separate from Israel, right? Some distance away, but he attacked, right? he, had, he attacked uh, Israel's enemies, and instead he used a, a very ragtag army. Basically, what happened was, was that the cave of Ajalon, right, the cave of Ajalon became the stronghold base for David. Right? It became a very stronghold base for David, and then his sort of ragtag guerrilla army, you know, raided, you know, enemy territory, like in small groups here and there, you know, knowing the nature and knowing, you know, the surroundings and everything, you know, fought their enemy uh, like that. And so, you know, really we come to find what kind of path that David chose, you know, what kind of life he lived, his heart, and what kind of path he chose, he chose. And so, you know, when we look at David and Saul, there is that kind of contrast. Now, here's the thing about life and how life is. Life has suffering. <laughs> all of us, all of us, no matter who we are, we will face suffering in our life. You know, we, we don't live a perfect life. We will all face suffering in our life. But then we have two choices, really, as we uh, go on the path, as we face suffering. Uh, we can live it meaningfully, like David, or we can live it meaninglessly, like Saul. Now, here's the thing about Saul. Saul could have had a great life. He was the king, right? He had money, he had possessions, he had power. But inexplicably, when you read about Saul, just like read the pages of 1 Samuel, and you'll see the inexplicable suffering that that, that Saul had, he kept being, you know, kept, you know, going crazy. You know, there was something like psychological, like spiritual and psychological inside of Saul that was, he was just like a crazy, crazy person, crazy job. He didn't start like that, right? We remember that Saul started off very humbly when he was anointed as king, but then, you know, because he was crazy over possessions and power, you know, he was crazy over like keeping these things and he felt threatened by David even though he was king and David really wasn't even, you know, trying to take over his king position or anything like that. But he had irrational anxiety. He had irrational anxiety over like keeping these things because he was, he was selfish towards them. And he was selfish towards them and led to that. And so, you know, I, <laughs> there was one time I had a, a counseling session with a Bible study student they said the same thing, like, oh, you know, they go crazy sometimes. You know, people, like, this, this happens. This is like a real thing that happens in the world. You know, there's this, like, inexplicable, irrational, like, craziness that we have. Like, we're anxious and we're so emotional, not in our right mind, and very jealous about something. You know, some kind of money or possessions or status or power or, or like, holding on to this. And then there's this other person or there's other people. Or, or, you know, or whatever it is, and, you know, there's just this, this inexplicable anxiety and emotion, not in our right mind, uh, that we have, and, and we go off and we do crazy things. There was this other brother that I met as well, too. He had a family, and he was like a student family at the time, but, you know, this person, this, this brother, he actually took the scholarship money that he was using for school, and, you know, he gambled the scholarship money. And then after he gambled away all his scholarship money, he took the credit cards, borrowed money off of it, and then he was like, you know, like, like crazily doing, he didn't tell his wife, you know, he was married, he didn't tell his wife, you know, everything that he was doing. And he was just like, like, like crazy, like into this, like gambling and money and, and these kinds of things. And, you know, he gave the testimony, he said, you know, he didn't know any better until he came to church. You know, how how crazy, right? How crazy and irrational, and it's like the d demonic possession by Satan. You know, we, we look at demon possession and we think that's like something crazy from, you know, long ago that has nothing to do with me, but, you know, really, think about how many people are demon-possessed these days. You know, crazily, irrationally, control uh, 
uh, by these satanic forces like that this happens. And so, you know, actually deep down inside of our spirit, you know, we, we know that, you know, the suffering and toiling of the world, it leads to nothing. And it just causes inexplicable anxiety over these possessions and money and status and job title and all of these things. And, you know, we know that it's just meaningless, really. And, but, but still it causes us these, this inexplicable anxiety. And what happens is we try to fight it off. You know, we try to fight it off, but, you know, it, it leads to nowhere because, you know, we're so weak. And then we just get into it. And then most people, they don't know any other way. Like, I think that that brother, before he met Jesus, he didn't know any other way. Like, this is just, just like, this is the way of life, and this is how the world is. And this is, you know, this is how I should live my life. And he just didn't know any other way. And I, and I think King Saul was like that as well, too, really. You know, the one who started so humbly like that, but I think he... Really, he didn't know any other way but living like this. But, you know, what I want to say is that there is another way. You know, there is another way in order to live our life meaningfully. And that is what David experienced. David experienced that and he showed us that at the cave of Ajah. That it was a, a meaningful suffering in that place, in the worst, worst of situation amidst debt and in a distress, and with other people as well that were in debt and in distress, but even amidst that worst of worst situation, David, with his heart, still had a strong desire to reconcile with Saul. Right? He really wanted to still be comfort, you know, to come back into Saul's good graces and to, to, to unite really with Saul. He wanted to reconcile with Saul. And not only that, he wanted to redeem, right? He wanted to redeem this world for God's kingdom. Right? He wanted the nation of Israel, the nation of God, to be redeemed inside of this world for God's kingdom. And so, you know, how was David able to have this reconciliation and this heart of redemption? You know, it, it, it came from a true, genuine place from the heart. You know, David had this deep, strong, spiritual, meaningful desire that truly came from his heart. It was the suffering and the serving in the cave of Agilum that confirmed that heart as true and genuine. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. Is that there was the suffering and the serving, and that what happened was, was that the true heart, through that suffering and that serving, confirmed it as genuine. Not this fake thing of Saul, of like irrational anxiety over all these things, but it was truly that we must suffer and serve together, live with love, live with love and reconciliation in our heart, and live for, for God's glory and kingdom and a better place in this world of thy kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. To really, it was confirmed as genuine here at the cave of Angel. And really, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that showed us that place too. It was the cross itself, the cross of Jesus, that was the most meaningful, genuine, and true act of redemption and reconciliation as well, too. Now, the pastor, a famous pastor, his name is Tim Keller, he said this, Christianity teaches suffering is meaningful. There is a purpose to it, and if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and spiritual power than you can imagine. It's true. Really, the cross is a deep nail into our heart that gives us a stability that the world cannot give us. You know, we live in the world, it is just this instability of anxiety and depression and all these kinds of things, but the suffering and the serving in the cave of Agila with the cross of Jesus in our heart and with other people with the cross of Jesus in their heart, it drives a stake into our heart and it gives us the stability, right, from this inexplicable anxiety that I have. It is that kind of stronghold place for us as well in our life. You know, we really, really need to see that. And so uh, the story continues. So uh, Saul eventually sees uh, his world crumble around him, right? Everything's going wrong for Saul eventually. And it's all, it's all due to his own sin, it's all due to his irrational anxiety. And, and anyways, his world starts to crumble without God. And then he ends up committing suicide, and then David becomes king, and that's what this is the story of Saul, and David becomes king. And how is David? Uh, David, he wins many, many battles, he rules Israel, and what he does is really at the end of his life is that he gives glory to God. And I'm going to read 
Um, so we read 1 Samuel 22. That was the first passage we read about the cave of Agilom, right? So I'm going to read a, like a parallel message in 2 Samuel. So we have 1 Samuel. I'm going to read 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22. So same chapter, parallel. <laughs> Right? So 1 Samuel 22, we're going to go to 2 Samuel 22, and then verse 1 through 3. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, and verse 1 through 3. David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hands of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. My refuge and my savior from violent men, you save me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think really in terms of the editors of the Bible, there was really an, an intention here to really show this. You know, from the cave of Adullam, you know, what is uh, David's confession here? It's that the Lord is my rock, right? The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. He is the rock I take refuge in. And I think this very famous verse, right? This is a very famous verse, actually. He is, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. This is a very famous verse, and, you know, the, the, it's very, you know, I think really when you look at this, it's a very clear reference to David's time in the rock of the cave of Ashton, right? It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a reference to taking refuge, when he took refuge in the rock that is the cave of Ajalon. It was the time in the cave of Ajalon that he was with the Lord that gave him strength that he needed. So when he walked this path in life, right, towards God's glory and his kingdom, there was a struggle for that. But, you know, the, the cave of Ajalon was his rock. In other words, the cave of Ajalon where he met rock bottom and met the Lord there, the Lord became his rock. You know, the really David, you know, David's path, it, it wasn't so smooth. You know, we think it like such an idealistic, like glorious way, but you know, there was a lot of struggle for David. Before he became king, even after he became king, there were struggles in David's life. But through it all, uh, we see that the Lord sustained him. Sustained him to keep on, keep on, keep on going. Like David, we have to get past our irrational anxiety and greed like Saul did. We have to live for something greater. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ gives us. Not only does he save us from sin, and that's what the Lord does, you know, I'm, I'm a sinner and I don't even deserve to stand here, but he saves us from sin and gives us eternal life. But not only does he give that, not only does the Lord give us, save us from sin and give us eternal life, but he gives us a bigger dream. A bigger dream for our life, a bigger dream for our king, for the for, for his kingdom, or life in his kingdom. You know, for from the cave of Ajalon, David carried that dream, right? To for was David carried a dream from the cave of Ajalon to a new kingdom, right? That's the golden age of Israel. It was a new kingdom that David built. It was uh, that that God built through David, and so it was from the cave of Ajalon to a new kingdom. Now, Jesus Christ is also giving us that kind of dream as well, too. You know, it's not just David, not just a story of long ago, not just a story of Israel back in its golden age and like this, but this is our story now. That kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. You know, there is a path towards that kingdom. And so, you know, the path of walking towards that kingdom, you know, this path is not, not an easy one. You know, the Lord told us it's a very narrow path. It's not broad like the world. But the broad path of the world with seemingly many opportunities in the world, right, it just leads to destruction. Oh, you know, I live in the world and so many elite opportunities to live like this and like that, but it just leads to destruction. The path the Lord gave us is a very narrow road, uh, but the path towards the kingdom is really the one that leads to life. And so, David, uh, like David, right, like David, we all must see the amazing hidden beauty of God's cave, God's kingdom that is inside the cave. Right? It's the beauty of God's kingdom that is inside the cave with the 400. It should be that strength. There was hidden beauty in that rock among the 400 who were suffering and in debt and in distress in the cave. They, there was a, something beautiful about comforting one another 
and suffering and serving together and thereby overcoming and winning over pain and sadness. That by these hurt ones that were being together with one another, they, these were hurt ones that were being together with one another inside of the Lord, that they could be together and then they could work together and then they could do something beyond their capability. Like who would ever thought that, you know, 400 in a, in a cave could build the golden age of a, of a great nation of God's nation of Israel like that. It's, it's, it's unthinkable for something like that to happen inside of the cave. So, you know, for those of us here, you know, in our church as well too, you know, look, uh, in, our, in our church and in our life, you know, we shouldn't be in despair if we look at ourselves right now and then it feels like we're in the cave of Adam in our life. You know, we shouldn't be in despair like that. Now don't be. You know, the cave of Agilum uh, could just be the beginning of something amazing that God gives us. It will be something amazing that God is, is giving us. Mm -hmm. You know, even for my life too. You know, there was a time in my life long ago that, uh, you know, oh, actually, it was looking pretty good for me in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, good opportunities. I, I, I worked on campus. I was a, a program, had one of, the, one of the better jobs, a programmer. And then because of that, I made a pretty good, um, you know, hourly wage, <laughs> you know, while on campus. And then while all everyone else in the college, um, you know, all my friends and everything had their own, had their kind of roommates, and they had to share the room, you know, with my roommate. But because I had the uh, a nicer, you know, uh, a nicer job that was giving me some extra cash at the time, I had my own room. <laughs> and my own room, and it was a very, very comfortable, and it looked. Look, look that way, and then uh, when I came to church, right, I started coming to church and I learned Bible study, and then they said, oh, come, you know, come live in the fellowship center, not, not, you know, not in your own room, but come live in the fellowship center, so that's what I did, and I lived in this cramped place with four or five brothers, you know, in that place, you know, in this one room with like four or five brothers, and it was, you know, if you live with brothers, you know, like that cramped like this, this is like cave imagine. For real, like <laughs> that's the that's the real cave of Agile is when you know many brothers live together like that. But you know we were there at that place and you know, we did God's work together, uh, even though um, we were insufficient. And you know I, you know I look at the, the people that were with us in the cave of Agile, <laughs> you know back then, and they're all like pastors now actually. <laughs> you know I look at them, you know I can I can think of five people that were there. They're all pastors, you know right now that live just at a different point. They're all pastors now. And, um, you know, the cave, that cave, right, was a strength to work for God, I think, for many years. You know, the ones who were there, the ones who were there in the cave, and then the ones who weren't there, you know, it's really different. You know, it was really different for us, even back then. And so there is a difference, I want to say that. There is a difference uh, between those who suffer together and serve together and those who didn't. And there's something, something very precious about that. So uh, today, uh, reflecting on today's message, I want to encourage you. Uh, to find the cave of Agilum. Don't go seeking out, finding some elite place and some elite things, but go and find the cave of Agilum. And then with gen people that, were more, that are genuine and true, brothers and sisters in church and in Christ, right? The Lord looks at the heart, right? Go, don't, don't go looking for the elite things, but look, go look finding your cave of Agilum. Let the cave, may, may, may Gracia, church, right? Be the cave of Agile, be a strength for all of us in our life. You know, like David, that, that place is what gives us the genuine and true heart that the Lord looks at, and the dream comes out from there, right? But the true genuine dream comes out from there, and with that, let us live a, a meaningful life, purposeful life, for the rock of the Lord is our strength ultimately. He is the one, He is our Lord, He is our or fortress and or deliver, we take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wish He can be our rock, the rock of our life too. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, from the cave of Agilum to the kingdom, we saw this genuine place uh, where David, uh, the king, the great King David of the golden age, age of Israel, started his path was in the cave of Agilum with the 400 that were in debt and in distress. And though they were suffering together, they understood one another and they helped and served one another. They suffered and they served one another in love, Lord. And Lord, in that way, Lord, you became the rock uh, for them, Lord. 
help them out and, and you gave them a true and genuine dream for the kingdom, Lord, and you helped them live a, really a meaningful life. Let us, Lord, also live a meaningful life in that way. Be with us, guide us, let the Lord be our refuge and our strength, be the rock 